Uh, I'm Andrew Shapley, and I've been doing work with nutrient management water quality for a while. I uh, used to work with ARS and USDA in Oklahoma and Arkansas, uh, and Pennsylvania, sorry. And then I decided to go uh, become an academic and uh, went over to the University of Arkansas. And um, I guess a couple of years ago, um, back in 07, Dennis invited myself and Brian Haggard up to uh, review the uh, program. And um, up there, as it was transitioning through, uh, I think, graduating some of the farms, and they were looking to reevaluate what they were doing, and brought a couple of people from outside. And uh, we were kind of so impressed with the program that we decided to come back and try and bring some of our farmers. And we got Farm Bureau involved, uh, who came up and took up a group of farmers to uh, meet Joe and, and Dennis and, and a couple of other, other growers up there. And uh, that was probably the key. I know a lot of other states down in the south and other parts of the country are looking to do this, but the key were us was, I think, probably similar to you, was getting Farm Bureau on board to open doors uh, to those farmers. Now, um, having said that, you know, I think our Farm Bureau is pretty, well, pretty progressive in Arkansas. They already have a, an environmental specialist working for Farm Bureau, which is probably seems to be unique because he's told they've basically decided they're not <coughs> going to avoid environmental concerns. They're going to try uh, and, and work with uh, whoever's going to be uh, coming down the, the, the track, so to speak. So they've taken a bit more of a proactive approach. Um, and so we've developed this program and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about it. It's very similar. You're probably going to see some very similar things, but it gives you an idea that it's progressed down from the Midwest, the North, down basically the Mississippi River to the southern part. And so some of the things are, are a little different. Okay. So we have our sponsors. And again, a key is um, getting a diverse group of, of, of sponsors. And you can see the page is pretty full there. You don't really need to you know, go into all the details, but NRCS have, uh, have certainly supported it. But it's getting a, a group of folks that are invested into this to help support it. Um, as, as the early speakers have mentioned, it's not cheap doing this type of work. Um, we all know it's critical. So we've got some of the commodity groups. One, I think Arkansas, we struggled at first because Arkansas is a very diverse state in terms of agriculture. There really isn't a dominant force there in terms of either dairy or soybeans or, or one. It's very diverse. We've got livestock. It's the second biggest to Georgia in poultry production. It's probably about uh, third or fourth in uh, beef production, cattle production, grazing. Um, it's number one in rice production. So it's got a huge diversity. So we really don't have a key member of a state that's going to push politically. Um, that was a bit of a struggle at first um, because we were diverse. But it gives us an opportunity, I think, with our farms to look at a, a, a very diverse setting. Um, and we have to control ourselves. And uh, I'll show you a picture of my no, co-workers and trying to not get overstretched in some things. But we've got industry, um, Monsanto, um, so. So the team uh, comprises of Mike Daniels, who works with Extension, some of you already probably know. Uh, Pearl Daniel, who now has joined, decided to leave and work with, go get a, uh, a massive with wildlife, in, in wildlife. We have, a, we've replaced her with another person, Neil Mays, who's was, uh, a farmer, went to school teaching, went back to do a master's degree, and now has become our um, technician. He's up in the north, and myself. So basically, we've got four, you know, four folks um, working to try and coordinate this. But like everybody knows and is aware, it's a farmer-driven program. And so we, uh, we're trying to develop a network. And I know some of you might be involved in that, a monitoring network because one of the keys is trying to do the same things, the same thing um, in the same way at different locations. Um, and that might mean that we, we are not using USGS because we couldn't afford it. Bottom line is we can't afford it. Um, we think we can do it ourselves with the same methods. 
for a fraction of the price, and so that's a decision that we made. So, you know, everybody kind of does it, but we make some decisions and then we, uh, we use EPA, EPA standard methods. We have, like everybody else, committees um, that uh, oversee the program, and these are stakeholder uh, uh, committees. Um, they're not advisory committees because the university didn't like having other people advise us what to do. So it was just a slight word change. They still do the same thing, but we just call them something slightly different. But we've got the major um, commodities here. And, and the way we approached it, this was, we don't want to get a bunch of our friends on, on our board telling us what to do. So we went to the Cattlemen's Association. We went to the Rice Federation, um, the poultry producers, and asked them, who would you like to be on our on the board to represent you on this program, and so they they s s um, selected somebody that would uh, be on this. Scott Simon is the Nature Conservancy. They're very interested in the program. They want to be involved in this idea of transparency. Hasn't been to a meeting yet, but you know it, it, they're there. So we, you know we 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 try uh, to to make this open, and you know you can't drag people in. So, but anyway, we're trying to make it, make it somewhat transparent. And you know, they, as it goes along, they're very supportive, and they want to keep wanting to expand. And the problem partly has become making sure that we don't expand too quickly and and cut ourselves too thin. That we're not doing a good job on where we are uh, already there. But we do have liaison folks on there. That, so we have another committee, which is a technical committee. That was basically the farmers. And now we have we decided. Well, we. Um, ADQ, we have the person that's overseeing the, um, the executive director of ADQ in the state. She decided she wanted to be on this program. Uh, and so we have some folks there that um, oversee the technical side of what we're doing, why we're doing it, keep us straight. Um, we wanted to have some protection, the question I asked earlier uh, for farmers, and we tried to get ADQ and EPA to give those farmers some protection from uh, being cited if there was a problem, because we know we might find problems on these farms, um, um, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't write a, a, anything in paper, but basically a gentleman's agreement that if you do find a problem because they're working on this program, we'll give them some leniency and then you can document <coughs> to show that they're doing their best uh, with the resources they have to address that issue. So. Um, that's always a question, and I think you know we mentioned we talked about it earlier when we we go interview and we ask farmers, would you like to be involved in this program? The first question they always ask is, is it uh, are EPA going to come and knock <coughs> on my door? And we can't say no. And and unfortunately, I'll touch on this a little bit. EPA are very aggressive in our part of it, in part of the country, and I, I suspect they're coming to a, a, a neighbourhood near you too. <laughs> If they're not already there, they're coming. <coughs> and they probably would be coming further if they hadn't been uh, sequestered uh, and lost some dollars. They would be even further. So these are the farms that we have. Um, we've now got eight farms. And as you can see, we're, we're, we're scattered a little bit. And I'm just going to briefly go, so I'm not going to talk too long, because I know I'm between you and lunch. But in the northwest part of the state, if you don't know, we have our beef poultry uh, production. As I say, it's uh, the second in the country, and it's basically all concentrated in this area. I think there's about two billion birds produced each year. I mean, it's a, it's a huge number. It's not there because Act needs that. Uh, those nutrients is there because there's an infrastructure, because there's feed mills and different. Uh, the system, the, the, the st strategically, it's built there because it's the best, cheapest way to, to produce uh, protein. And so it's not there because those soils were uh, infertile or they were row crop. They, they um, have produced a very synergistic beef cattle production um, uh, in synergy with those because they're using those nutrients. And now we've come into an issue that we're going to have to address is lawsuits. Um, and so we have one, of them, one lawsuit, a couple of lawsuits, sorry. Uh, the water basically in the Illinois River and there's another one up here in the Uchispavanar drain into Oklahoma. And again, this is one of the things that you're, go you're going to get. Um, it probably is not going to go away. The issue, once it crosses a state line, the um, Oklahoma say this is a scenic river, and they have a 0.037 
criteria on that, and so everything's got to be at or below 0.037 total P, which, uh, as some we've already heard, some folks say that's probably what's coming off some forested areas. That doesn't, that, that doesn't matter, sorry. If you're from a regulatory point of view, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's what's happening, but yeah, that, that's the limit. Uh, that's the limit above which that uh, the they start to see degradation in these, these areas. And so that's put pressure, and it really created an issue with us because farmers don't want to open themselves up in a litigated watershed. They have started to now. The poultry operation here is just outside the watershed. Um, so um, basically that requires them to all have a nutrient management plan um, um, to operate or to even to apply anything, whether it's fertilizer or, or manure. Um, but it's allowed a very good prosperous beef production because it's cheap source of nutrients, they got better forage production, they could run more cattle on the same acreage of land. Uh, and what this has happened with the nutrient planning going towards phosphorus rather than nitrogen based is cut back their litter applications by a th two thirds. So they were applying about three tons per acre, they're now applying 1.3. Um, they're not getting enough nitrogen. Some of them are trying to, to, to offset because they're not making any money selling litter. They're basically selling the litter for the same price that they happen to get bedding material for the house and it's a recycling process there. Um, we have seen some evidence of numbers of animals being reduced because of the uh, reduction in uh, allowable regulated levels of, uh, of nutrients that can be applied, mainly nitrogen. Uh, they're not putting on enough basic enough nitrogen, not getting forage there, especially this last year when we had the severe drought, we saw quite a dramatic reduction in the number of uh, cattle. And so, you know, there's an economic impact. And so a lot of the things that we've seen and we've heard is the indirect effect of some of the consequences that we're seeing are, are, are what we really, what, what the farm, the, the, basically the poultry farms are not suffering because they're producing birds. Uh, it's those that were benefiting from that really uh, good source of nutrients that are really suffering. And so we're trying to help them with this part of this discovery farm program. If you go down in this area of the major issue, issue here, here is when you talk to farmers uh, last year, basically they go to bed, last, the last question they're asking themselves, uh, the husband and wife is, do, will we have enough water tomorrow to survive? And so that's the key question for them. So we are focused on water quality, but we, um, most of our farmers, water quality is not their concern. It's, they don't have enough water for it to be running off in a lot of these cases. Water quantity is their, is their, is their major uh, commodity to, for survival. And so we're really addressing, trying to look at maybe rotations, different systems uh, that are economic to uh, improve water use efficiency. So again, we just talk about, you know, like everybody does, these are the farmers, we just <coughs> trying to do this just to show they're real people, uh, that they are um, not something that pe you know, people just don't understand who aren't involved with uh, farming. And so these are the uh, different farmers that we've got working for us, that's, that's half of them. Um, and so I'm, I don't have any data, but I'll, 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 we've got some numbers, I'll mention them. The first farm is Marley Farm up in the northwest Arkansas. And here we basically had the same approach as, as Dennis did. Go talk to the farmer. What do you want us to look at? What do you think is your most immediate problem that you want to be addressed? And uh, rather than us, Mike or I, going up there thinking we can do a better job than they do, we can't. And so the, he wanted to know what was, what was the impact of his production facility. And so he wanted to know how much dust uh, and spillage when you clean out these poultry houses, if you're not familiar with them, they, they clean out every about six weeks and they drag litter out. Um, they move the birds every six weeks, they might clean out every year and a half, but they drag a lot of litter out and it stays there, it spills, it rains, it washes off. Um, the problem with that is when EPA are doing their site inspections, and they do do site inspections, they have been coming on these farms even though they are not capos. They come on these farms, spot checks, if they see dust outside a farm, if they see a pile of uh, manure, even though it's slightly, it is spilled out when it's been brought out of the house, they, they can see it, so therefore it's a problem. 
And so uh, that has been a, become a real issue with these types of operating systems. And I know there's a couple of lawsuits over in the Chesapeake Bay in terms of runoff as from, from actually around the production facilities. So he wanted to look at that, and that's what we were. Um, he's got 10 poultry houses. Um, uh, as, you, uh, as you see, he, he's very, very good farmer, working w um, with a very productive beef operation. And so it's, it's, it's synergistic. And so these are the houses. Uh, you can see the, uh, the end of the houses where they will remove the birds or the, um, uh, uh, the contract folks will come in and do that. So they're not, they're not farming. They don't have the same initiative to keep his place quite as clean. These, these farms don't do that work themselves. They hire it out. Therefore, it's somebody who really wants to get in, out, the next farm. And their criteria are not quite the same as maybe Jeff's is in keeping the place as spotless. It's, it's a time you got, as Joe, and on show, you've got certain things you've got to get done if you don't, you know, um, and you only got so many hours in a day. And so um, what we've, what's happening here is uh, we have three sites uh, and we're measuring in the pond. And so runoff from these houses here is going into the pond and we've got a, a flume here. We have these four houses which collect, basically collect water here. We've done some berming to concentrate flows into our monitoring stations. Um, and then we have a grass waterway here and another monitoring device here. So basically what we're looking at here is trying to look at the, what's coming off of these. This is pretty closely linked to these houses here. It's not very far. Um, how much that nutrients have been trapped in that pond? This pond does overflow slightly at certain times of the year, and so we've got a, a, a weir there. Um, there's a lot, these four houses, just for the lay of the land. Um, again, we're not trying to change too much the land. We'll put our devices where we think we can collect water from a known area, uh, and most conveniently without affecting. Uh, we um, have helped the farmer offset some cost in fencing out this area, this paddock here, so that it's not grazed anymore. Uh, because we didn't want to interfere with this idea of this, is this natural buffer system, this normal grass pasture, a, a cheaper uh, option than maybe pond construction? And we know there's issues that we're gonna hear tomorrow, I think, a talk about some toxicity of algae that can grow in ponds that can cause issue with, with cattle drinking that water. So there's, there's always issues. Um, we're looking at other things with the uh, emission that you can probably make out here. This area is a little lighter, and that's the dust from the fans. It, it's emitted out of the, out of the houses. Um, and so we will um, monitor it here as it goes into, <coughs> into the flume. Again, we've got different stations depending on the size of the area that we're looking at. Uh, custom kind of tailored. This is the largest one we've had. The grass has grown up around it now. Uh, this is the flume two, and you can see, I think here there's a third flume. Um, and so it's about 100 meters of grass that it goes through. Um, Jeff thinks that that will be enough. It's a very sleep, it's probably less than a percent slope. So it's a very slow slope. But that other flume, can you back up once? Was that built, or was that already some kind of a natural spillway in? Or because that's kind of a, a beast? Yeah, the, the flume wasn't built, no. We, we burned the area, so we concentrated the flow into this point. It was, this was an area that was wet. That's where the water was naturally going. Okay. It was naturally going that way. We put a slight berm so it wouldn't divert off to the sides, and we could collect it. Um, and yeah. it, that's just a, a natural on the far pond, or? Yep. Okay. Um, and does it leave, or it's just a stay? It there? stays there. Uh, it probably leaves um, once a year, possibly. Oh, it overflows. It overflows okay. occasionally. Um, he's using it some for drinking water. There is another part, small pond down here. The the White River, which is a uh, a scenic river, is down here. So it does get trapped into another one. Usually, it doesn't overflow because. The, um, it's, he's using it. We have another farmer they're working with who's actually filtering that water and using it as drinking water for his chickens. He's, he felt that he could save uh, money on his utility bill because he was on city water 
um, and he has actually put a filtering system that's recycling that back into the house, um, and he got approval from his integrator to do that, that uh, he felt that, uh, that uh, health-wise the birds weren't going to, but he's, he feels that, that putting that filtering and pumping system in paid for itself in a couple of years just because of the water bill. Uh, so there's, again, different options, but yeah, EPA say that's, that's fine, that's waters are not leaving the farm, uh, as long as it doesn't overflow. Just a point, because both Doyle and your talk, you're looking at what's running off the facilities or mm -hmm. in his lot. We wouldn't be able to do this in Wisconsin because our allowable level of loss is zero from the facilities if you're capable. And we knew that we would never get a zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know you're not going to get zero. So that would be the difference between our states because Amber said we don't do facility losses. On a permitted farm, you're only allowed zero. But it's good that you guys have the flexibility to at least be able to do Did everybody hear that in the back? No. Um, Janice, do you want to say that again? Do the list work? No, that's that's yeah. for the recording of the actually. Uh the question was Dennis made the comment that they really couldn't do that because um, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in Wisconsin the uh, discharge from a farm would be zero. A, a permitted farm, a CAFO, and so they really couldn't do this type of work because they know that the, the, the levels that they are required to get off of that farm are uh, zero, and so they didn't do that. So they were just saying that that's a difference that we can have the flexibility to do this. Um, we don't have, and correct me, Carl, who's at the back, who we'll work with, we don't have any CAFOs in... Um, <coughs> We don't have any KFOs in Arkansas, do we? We maybe have one or two. We've got one permitted one KFO. So that's that's a decision that the farmers have made is not to become a KFO to be permitted. That But we are seeing, uh, even though these aren't KFOs, EPA is still inspecting, inspecting them. So that's why I say, you know, uh, there's a concern. Now. No, I'm not concerned now. You need to be aware that even though these are not KFOs, these are open to inspection by EPA. Um, and, and so what we saw was, um, and again, it was backing into it. Yes? 230,000 chickens is not a KFO? No, it's not. <laughs> Carl, do you want to? Uh, the question was 200,000, 230,000 chickens is not a KFO. That's enough birds that that would put you into the large KFO range, but the definition then has to be whether there is a discharge from that KFO range. Well, we don't have any discharge Right. Technically, it is a KFO just because of size. Right. No. But the difference is permit or no permit. Yeah. So they're not permitted. Yeah. KFOs. Okay. They're still KFOs. Yes. Permit. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's a large number of animals on a small plot of land. You're right. Yes. It's a technical difference. I guess it's it's some of the vagaries with that with Arkansas. That that, that, that I guess that's the farmer's choice at the moment. So it's a debate, isn't it? I mean, it's a debate that we're having there, I and mean, I guess it's other, other growers. Uh, I guess if they would decide to go KFO, then they get some protection, but they have to comply. And I think they've chosen not to at the moment. Um, so what we uh, found was um, on this farm um, and another one, we put some weirs there just because we were looking at something else to start with. But the the, the uh, weir that was near the fans was getting about two parts per million on average when it rained and coming off. The, the, the weir that was further away uh, from the fans was probably a half of that to a, to a third of that. So we, we kind of knew that some of this dust was getting into the water and so um, what we have seen, the numbers that we're finding here, 
is um, that we are getting, um, here we're getting about two parts per million. Um, it, obviously, it's going to vary from storm to storm size, but by the time it gets down to here, it is around uh, 0.5. So it's, and I think this, this area will, it'll um, uh, grow and um, probably we get a, a bigger, better stand of grass. But anyway. Same, I guess the same question. You, you plan on harvesting that. He was going to he was going to cut it for hay, yeah, yep, yep. and remove the nutrients, yep. yeah. And so this is working effect. This is removing nutrients, just a natural grass waterway. What we are doing on some research sites is looking at how long of a grass waterway one might need and what effect, uh, how much of a reduction can you get? Um, again, like we don't have the same. Uh, constraints, I suppose, as you do in terms of we do have an index and we do have a risk, but we don't have a endpoint that we're trying to reach and attain yet. We just want to know that we are doing the best we can and we're, we're, we're either minimizing any losses or at least uh, reducing them by a certain percentage. Uh, the pond itself uh, is averaging about 0.05 uh, and what's going in again is about, point, uh, is about 2 ppm. And so we're seeing a dramatic reduction. That's an uptake from sediments, and it's biological. Those ponds are going to be, have to be cleaned and maintained every probably 10, 12 years. Um, but we are seeing an efficient um, trapping of nutrients on the farm. Um, and the second farm I just wanted to just touch on is where the, here we're looking at it's a different, it's a row, row crop situation. Uh, he will use poultry litter he will, if he can get it. This is um, about uh, 100 to 120 miles away from northwest Arkansas. Not a lot of litter is getting down that far down there. Um, but um, we d he wants to grow cover crops. So we have an a MRBI <coughs> program, which you're probably aware of in the Mississippi River Basin, and cost sharing to putting cover crops on this place. And so uh, we kind of found a, uni a unique situation where you have all our monitoring sites pretty close together here. Uh, the same as what you were showing, Amber, uh, with the, uh, the sensors, um, or ISCO samplers, and um, telemetrics to tell us when there's a runoff event. Um, but we're sampling at this kind of point, all these fields drain to this area. This goes into a ditch, uh, and by you, and uh, off the um, some of it goes off this bayou uh, uh, off the farm, but this is an irrigation district where uh, there's drainage is being constructed. Runoff at these sites is actually going down a standpipe out into a, into a, a, a ditch. And so we've used that pipe as our flow monitoring. So it's like we've heard this morning, you've got to be very flexible in what you do and, you, and how you adapt to it. We've got velocity flow meters rather than these pressure transducers, and they work really well. They're expensive. Uh, they're probably three times as much. I think that the transducers cost about 1,500. These cost about th three and a half thousand, um, but they work well. And they work, you can put them in a horizontal flow pipe that's going to be full of water most of the time, but because water is just standing in that ditch, but when water runs off, it's going to flow, and you, then you measure it when it flows. And it's like you say, it, it, it's, it, a lot of it is this learning process as you go along and, and talking to folks and how they do something. Um, and so we did get some additional to look at this three-tiered monitoring. Hey, we're doing the edge of field. We also need to look at um, you know, what's happening. So we, we've got um, some old ISCO samplers that we're going to put on a bayou and monitor over the same time period at different seasons of the year and probably set them like every two hours to run over two or three days. And so we're getting this, uh, uh, this uh, um, transect down this to look at what the impact of these fields might be on, on this stream. Um, we do know we're doing a lot of work now uh, on legacy, um, although the Discovery Farm part is not actually looking at that, but we as researchers are trying to use this infrastructure to look at legacy effects. How, much, how long, you know, we know it, but the buildup of nutrients in soils and buffers and other things is quicker than the drawdown and how long and um, will it take, uh, how, many, how much nutrients are stored in this bayou and the sediments are in the, 
is that going to modify what you see in the edge of field? Uh, we see that it does. We see that in storm flows, it mitigates, the, it reduces the losses, the uh, inputs, but in other flow, it releases back, so it's a source. Um, sorry. And so these are some of the, the, the sites here at the mouse farm. Again, you can see the, the, the pipe, the standpipe is just um, the other side of here, and this is where the water is exiting. Sorry, this is where the field, this is where it's leaving the field, sorry. Uh, and then it's going into this bayou, bayou here. So we've got our uh, sampler and our flow monitoring it in the standpipe. This farm, these two farms here presented another unique situation. Um, and there were two farms basically on either side of the Langyu River, which is a... Um, a a critical river, we've got a TMDL, but the TMDL is for sediment. Um, and um, it's one of the focus watersheds, one of the 40 focus watersheds in the Mississippi River Basin Initiative. And so there's some funding to help this part of this program. But uh, one of the guys on one side was conventional tilling. The other one, for the, all the same you know, reasons we've heard it today, uh, he chose to do uh, <coughs> no-till convention, uh, conservation, switchgrass buffers, probably everything that he could think of. And he would just basically did this because that's what he chose to do. He wasn't, uh, he didn't get any cost share. Uh, he is gonna put some ponds <coughs> and recycle some of that water on his farm. Um, but there's two farms there, one's a conventional and one is the uh, a, a no-till or conservation. Um, and again, it's like every, doesn't, what works for one doesn't work for everybody. Um, and so we have a kind of a neat situation here where we can compare the one and the two and they're in the same geographic zone, same basic soil, soil types. Um, and so that's gonna help, uh, again, it's making the most of what we got in the field when we do this type of work. The Dabs Farm, which I'll, um, this is the last one I'll just basically talk about, is um, he decided to go with um, zero grading and basically trash every drop of water that he can off his farm. He was uh, getting water off a bayou that came down here along this roadway from the city about 10 miles down uh, away of Stuttgart when his grandfather was on that farm. Now um, that he's the 50th person along that line to be drawing water out and there's basically nothing getting to him anymore. There's still the same amount of water going, but there's so many other people drawing from it now, so many other people using it. So he decided he has a reservoir which is on his property, and basically he's he's graded all of these for fields and his property so that during the uh, <coughs> rainy season, what there is of it, he can recharge his reservoir. He pumps it back and uses it irrigation. He's got tailwater recovery system that flows it back in. So here we're going to be looking at you know what is the build up of nutrients, build up of salts. Uh, in that water over a period of time. Um, but uh, he felt that if he incorporated corn into some of his rotations, he gets a better yield after corn. And corn's got a deeper root system, it's breaking up that soil and he's getting a better, he feels <laughs> he's getting a better water use uh, efficiency, he's using less water on the next crop. He wanted some data to prove that, um, partly for himself, but like uh, we've heard this morning, partly for other farmers to see. Um, uh, we've just seen this exactly the same thing, is that farmers learn from others. Uh, what they see something working on, on your neighbors, they're going to do it. Um, again, it, it's, it's working. The levees, we've got these, um, we've had a challenge with, uh, as they change the, the level in the field and these levels, is that this flume has to be, has to move up and down with the field um, system, so to speak. And so we, we, we've got the, um, we're trying <coughs> to make them in a way that you can actually lift up that grounding point where you're measuring your flow as your baseline. But a large part of it is doing some um, stakeholder, um, just to keep us on track here. We've done a lot of work. Um, we've, got the, we've got it established, we've got data, we had a dry year last year, the year before we had a wet year. This year we're probably going to have it look like we're going to have more of a normal year. All the farmers tell us 
don't, you can't release this data because they, you know, we've only got a year. They know better than we do. There's a lot of variability from year to year. We do have pressure, obviously, from the folks that are you know, watching what we're doing for information. So there's got to be a trade-off there at some stage. But we've done a lot of work with, uh, with Walmart Sustainability Group legislators. We've, we've been very successful and very lucky to have people like uh, Debbie Moreland, who's somebody that works for the conservation districts, that's connected us with uh, the politic politicians to come out and look. They come out and look, think it's great. A lot of them that are on our committees now, we have uh, term limited, they keep recycling through. Most of them don't have a clue about agriculture, although they're making decisions at a state level about agriculture. And this is, I think we've tried to use this to educate as what goes on on a farm. Um, and so that's a part of it. It isn't research, but it's this outreach. It's, this, it's a, a really important component. Last year we had uh, the folks from the other groups come down to look at uh, what we were doing down there. But it's like everybody said, it's this is farmer empowerment. Um, uh, and we've seen, I guess, um, one of the successes of this is the farmers getting involved in, in this program, taking ownership in it, being empowered in it, while we are getting some information. Um, I think, like, like you say, uh, Dennis mentions, I think, in the back of their mind that they're, they're doing a good job in, in terms of water quality. And, you know, the, the rub's going to come at some stage if there is an issue. We're working with them to address that issue. Uh, future plans, just quickly. Uh, water use efficiency is important. We did get some funding through the Walton family uh, that has to go be used in the, in the litigated watershed. We're kind of somewhat concerned because that lawsuit hasn't uh, been settled yet. Um, uh, and farmers don't want to open themselves up for uh, inspection or, or, or criticism in a way. Uh, we've done some surveys with Jenny Pop and others in the university. We've, we've uh, brought in a lot of other researchers to do work and help us. Uh, Carl's helped us, um, engineers. But we've done our surveys of farmer attitudes at, at field days. What do they think about conservation? Did they do something? Why didn't they do it? What stopped them from doing it? Um, to try and understand, like you say, what drives them to do or not do something. And then if we know that, we've got a better idea of how to re retailer our extension activities. So one of the things that we're going to do on the new farm will be look at soil quality or, or soil health. Uh, it's a rotational grazing operation. He feels he's, he wants to build his organic matter up from about 1% to about 3 4%. He thinks he can do that with rotational grazing. Uh, we want to document that. Uh, and we're also going to look at now trying to work with farmers that are going to build new poultry houses and try and develop those with a low footprint. Can you uh, design a, a, a poultry house that's economical but has a low water quality footprint? Um, and so what we've done, um, we, we've, we have a lot of issues with poultry operations or, or any sort of facility and we're always going back and retrofitting something to an existing operation. But if we had the flexibility to build that in the first place in a way that was environmentally friendly, so we feel that's a really exciting opportunity if we can get engineers and somehow involved into designing that, that, those barns, those houses in a way that uh, incorporate these BMPs in the first place, we can do it cheaper than we, we, we can uh, have to go back and retrofit. So that's, that's, that's what we have. Thank you.